The protests may have been flying thick and fast, but all of the teams and drivers agree they're happy at least to have a race back at Mount Panorama. You know, about two months ago, the Bathurst 1000 looked to be deader than my friend Patrick Neal here, resting in peace in the Bathurst Cemetery. But thanks to a massive injection of capital from Tui's, it seems that the Bathurst 1000, or the Tui's 1000, as it's now known, is alive and well and throbbing in the bosom of petrol heads all over Australia. And we thought we'd celebrate that rescue, that dramatic financial rescue, in song. What better song than Tui's own famous jingle? <clears throat> Ready, Mr. Music? How do you feel about a thousand clicks around the old hot mix in Bathurst Town? How do you feel? You want to pack your kit, drive up the road a bit to watch the boys go around? How do you feel? It's Dicky and Brock, the pace is hot without a doubt. How do you feel? The General and Ford settle all scores till the flag comes out. How do you feel? About the slide and slam on the old race camp, seven sport. How do you feel? The sponsors bail, Bathurst might be nailed, it might come to naught. How do you feel? You need a load of bucks, it's the panorama drama again. How do you feel? You need to sign a new deal. I feel like two E's. I feel like two E's. Two E's, six million. Only 48 cars to start this year. The stewards have ruled out seven comp several competitors. They're not happy about it. But let's check out who are the top qualifiers for this year's great race, the Tui's 1000. Saturday's pole qualifying has been a traditional part of the 1000 for several years. But yesterday's Tui's top ten was strictly for the dollars. 40,000 of them, in fact. The protest entered by Tom Walkingshaw against the Sierras of Dick Johnson, Tony Longhurst and Colin Bond on Friday effectively meant the Ford boys had precious little time to ready their cars for the Tui shootout. Johnson's counter-protest against Walkingshaw's Holden didn't affect proceedings as Uncle Tom was well outside the top ten. Yeah, it should have been sorted out on Tuesday and Wednesday at scrutineering when they went through. We asked them to do it for their own accord. Uh, they all can't be right. We only want to know which one's right but there's about seven different versions out there. Uh, six of them are wrong. And welcome back to Mount Panorama at Bathurst. For the first time ever, a warm-up Sunday morning prior to the start of the Tui's 1000. The car's just going out onto the circuit now. And we're tracking around with George Fury, car number 30, the Peter Jackson Nissan Skyline. Sharing the car with him today will, of course, be Mark Scaife, driver who ran into a spot of bother here on Friday when taken out of the field of play into the concrete wall, so they had a little work to do on the number 30 car. But uh, George Fury from Tal Malmo in New South Wales, looking sharp as he goes across the top of Mount Panorama. Oh, Neil Crompton, I think uh, this 20-minute warm-up on the Sunday morning would be an innovation the drivers would appreciate. Very much so. For years, the drivers have cried out for a warm-up in this race. How many times have we seen guys breaking axles on the start line? getting shunts at the first corner and uh, as a result of the fact that the tyres aren't warm, the transmissions aren't warm and neither are the drivers for that matter. So this is an opportunity to get everything in readiness and uh, with this event being run under FIA international rules, it's a mandatory requirement that uh, they have a warm up. So George Fury giving the Nissan something at the moment, just getting it to full operating temperature and some of the teams using this uh, as a chance to just bed in their final set of brake pads scrub up the final set of tyres and make sure that everything's hanging in there. There's race cam now with Alan Grice who will be driving car number two, the FAI Insurance's Commodore. Sharing the driving with uh, Alan today will of course be Wynne Percy. They ran so strongly here last year. Had an accident uh, also on the Friday as I recall, put the car into the wall at the top of the mountain. Had a huge rebuilding job. Uh, but they were very competitive in the early part of the race. Gricey back from Europe where he's been campaigning for Nissan and he seems reasonably happy with uh, car number two. Blew an engine in that car on Friday, I think it may have been Friday morning. Right at the end of the first session the car was going pretty well but all of a sudden it let go on this pit straight in a huge way and they had to do a lot of work on the car to get it back in shape. But Grice was pretty happy yesterday in the Tui's top 10 shootout. 
and recorded a healthy time. And it's a very good looking car, the FAI Insurance Commodore, with a lot of uh, good work put into it. Les Small, the guy behind it, he's the chief engineer. And the roadways team have always done pretty well here at Bathurst, and Grice was the winner in 86. We love football, me, my kangaroos and holding cars. Football, me, my kangaroos and holding cars. That's football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. Football and meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. I think you better tell me again. We love football, me, my kangaroos and holding cars. In case you're wondering, this film is brought to you by football, meat pies, kangaroos and Australia's own car. They go together, underneath the southern star. You know, for just on 20 years, the good old all Aussie trusty Holden has successfully rattled down pit lane. The lane and thankfully the Holden have changed a fair bit over the years and a variety of racing Holdens have been more successful here at Mount Panorama than any other manufacturer. McPhillamy Park, thank you, driver. Make sense to me! The Bathurst Honour Roll shows Holden as the all-time champion with 13 wins. The Battle of the Brands has always been close, and Ford aren't far behind with 10. That accounts for 23 of the 27 wins to date, with Vauxhall, Mercedes-Benz, Jaguar and Morris battling for the Miners. However, the indications this season suggest that Ford aren't far away from victory number 11. Nick Johnson's Shell Sierras ran away with the national touring car crown. Alan Moffat kept the ball in Ford's corner at Sandown recently. And overseas, Andy Rouse conquered England's touring car classic at Silverstone, whilst the Texaco Fords run by Rudy Eggenberger have set the pace in the European Championship. Frightening stuff for Holden fans, isn't it? This sudden crush from the Blue Oval Badge Boys sent a ripple to Australia's touring car kings at Holden, and then responded accordingly. Inevitable defeat was postponed last year by Peter Brock with his ninth Bathurst win, and by Alan Moffat after winning the first round of the inaugural World Championship and finishing fourth at Spa. But the performance comparison to the Ford was disastrous no matter how you looked at it. Holden's new marriage with Tom Walkinshaw Racing in the UK was the answer. The trick? To find more from the existing car. The wind tunnel was the first stop, and armed with plenty of clay, TWR found heaps of downforce. Making a 1300 kilogram car slip through the air wasn't easy. Walkinshaw described the car as having the aerodynamics of a brick. TWR's idea was to make the brick fly. On paper, it looked easy enough, but time and money were eaten up finding the answers. After romping with the Play-Doh, this is what they did. From the Clark Kent guise of a normal VL series Commodore, the base group ASS was devised. Under the skin, changes were aplenty, but it was the addition of 21 fiberglass components that drastically changed the shape and performance of the car. Which led to the full-blown weapon, the wild-looking new Group A race car. But one thing had to be added, more grunt. The extra horsepower came via a fuel-injected version of one of the oldest and most successful engines in motorsport, Holden's 308 V8. The complete package is made for circuits like Spa and Bathurst. With just under 500 horsepower and a body built for business, the Holden carries the hopes of many. I think everybody is uh, quietly confident that we've got the, uh, the goods uh, with this particular car. We haven't had quite the amount of development and testing uh, in, a, in a race environment as we would have liked, but uh, Larry and the guys behind the scenes have been doing a tremendous amount of work, and at the end of the day, we won't have any excuses. The aerodynamic package that has been developed in the wind tunnel is a big step, you know, flying cars around the world and get them in the wind tunnels. The engine incorporates the very latest in electronic fuel management, uh, all that stuff's real state of the art and uh, uh, they've matched it with, uh, I say, uh, durability components, uh, ton rods, uh, crankshaft blocks, all things that help us race-wise and make your road engine last ten times as long are all there and I think it's going to be a real good package. If it's possible to end up with the opposite to a Ford Sierra, this car is it. Tom Walkinshaw, Larry Perkins Engineering and Holdens have made a massive commitment to the new Commodore. Right now in the pit paddock, there's a few execs nervously awaiting 4.30 and the moment of truth for their new toy. They're hoping, of course, the lion will roar.
Explaining the power of the Ford is tough, but the RS500 Cosworth version of the Sierra is a fast weapon. To help your understanding of how much power it has, imagine a car with seven times the power of your basic Nissan Pulsar, or over twice as much power as Tom Selleck's Ferrari. Powered by a turbocharged four-cylinder engine, the twin-cam 16-valve power plant turns this fast touring car into a fire breather. With big brakes and a well-balanced chassis, this package is the most formidable bar none. Turbocharging enabled Ford's engineers to keep the weight down using a tiny engine, and they've generated the kind of horsepower seen not so long ago in Formula One cars. The Ford Sierra. There's Tony Longhurst just coming off the top of the mountain onto Conrod Strait. Bicentennial Bits, brought to you by Doug Mulray, an Australian doing his bit to Australia. It's hard to imagine, looking at the sophisticated cosmopolitan Bathurst of today, the wilderness that existed here when Captain James Cook first sailed up the Great Western Highway in 1770. Of course, the trip from Sydney 200 years ago took a week, nearly twice as long as it takes us on the fabulous Aussie roads of today. The world already knows Pitt Town and Pittsburgh, but here is yet another famous place named after Sir William Pitt, Pitt Strait. Of course, over behind me, George Strait and uh, Castle Ray Strait over here. It was here Captain Cook decided to build a motor racing circuit. Of course, the motor car hadn't been invented back then, let alone raced. But Cook, a man of vision, knew it had to come. Sailing to Bathurst was very hard. And besides, he had shares in Ampol. Over the next 200 years, Bathurst grew from a two-bit boring backwater with a dusty racing circuit to a two-bit boring backwater with a very big racing circuit. Of course, facilities have been improved too. Gone are the days when you plugged in your vibrator and all the lights went dim. Now it's all mod cons. 20 watts, good boy. Get this into you. What a lad. <laughs> In 1988, our bicentennial year, drivers travelled from all over the world to participate in what is widely recognised as one of the greatest motor racing contests of them all. Protest time at the TUI's 1000, Bathurst. A time best forgotten. Bicentennial Bits, brought to you by Doug Mulray, an Australian doing his bit to Australia. Doug Mulray, the man who turned insanity into an industry. 